Hi everyone and welcome to episode 4 of Fast Lead Basics. If you're just starting out with Fast Lead, you should check out the Fast Lead Basics playlist to get yourself up to speed. In this episode, we'll mainly be looking at two different Fast Lead techniques involving waves and blurring. The topics we're going to cover in this episode are uh, understanding the output of beat sign 8 and beat sign 16, how to use phase offset and time base, adding waves together, creating sawtooth waves, and 1D blurring. One quick thing to note here, if you're trying these examples on a strip longer than 255 LEDs, uh, you'll need to change from using uh, unsigned 8-bit integers to unsigned 16-bit integers instead. And instead of using beat sign 8, you'll have to be uh, using beat sign 16. Either way though, uh, let's begin with those functions. The beat sign 8 function outputs a sine wave for us to do with as we wish uh, and takes the following parameters. So the first parameter is the beats per minute or how many waves per minute the function is going to output. And the wave that is generated has a maximum value of high val and a minimum value of low val. If we're using beat sign 8, these values can range from 0 to 255. Uh, but if we need a higher resolution wave, we can use beat sign 16 instead, uh, in which case the maximum value is 65535. The minimum value is still 0, of course. We can also play with the time base and the phase offset, uh, but we'll talk about those in a few minutes. We can enter the BPM in two different ways. The simplest and more usual way of doing this is just to specifying an integer BPM uh, between 1 and 255. If, however, you need more precision, you can also use fixed point numbers. Uh, this is easier than it sounds. Uh, for example, if we want a BPM of 120.3, uh, we just multiply this by 256, which gives us uh, 30796, and we would enter this as our BPM. So if the library sees a number greater than 255, it basically assumes that we've entered it in this uh, fixed point format. Let's look at our first bit of code using beat sign 8 and have a look here at line uh, 17. So here we specify a sine wave at 30 beats per minute from a minimum value of zero to a maximum value of numleds minus one, which is going to be 17 in my case. Uh, and we specify no phase offset uh, and no time base. Here I've asked the code to print out the values of sine beat uh, to the console. So let's have a look and see what that looks like. Looking at the uh, serial plotter here, we can see that it's outputting a sine wave between 0 and 17, as requested, at 30 beats per minute, uh, which is a wave every 2 seconds, or 0.5 hertz, if you want to do it in terms of frequency. Now we've got this wave, we have to decide what to do with it. Uh, and we could attach it to almost anything. We could control the brightness of an LED, the hue or saturation, uh, the red value of a particular pixel. What I've done here, though, is use it as the position of a pixel uh, to color blue. So I can see it LEDs sine beat equals CRGB blue. Of course, if I just had the code do that, um, after half a wavelength, all the LEDs on the strip would be lit up. So I'm also calling a fade to black by uh, in order to reduce the brightness of the whole strip by a small amount each time it's called. As you can see, this results in a blue pixel moving smoothly up and down the strip and leaving a lovely sort of glowing tail behind it. What if we want to add more glowing pixels though? Now is a good time to introduce phase offset and time base. The phase of a wave is by how much it's offset in time uh, from another wave. So here I've created a wave at 60 beats per minute uh, between 0 and 255 with no phase offset and no time base. And it's shown on that uh, the image below. You can see that I've labeled the bottom axis here from 0 to 255 with 0 being at the start of the wave and 255 at the end. Let's now create another wave with a phase offset of 64. You can see that this wave is shifted by one quarter of a wave uh, relative to our original wave. We could also make another wave uh, with a shift of 127. Uh, this is shifted by half a wavelength relative to the original wave. Uh, and so basically it's a mirror image of the first. We can say that this yellow wave here is in antiphase. If you're using beat sign 16, all of this still applies, of course, but the phase offset goes from 0 to 65535 rather than uh, to 255. Another way to specify the offset of a wave is to use the time base instead. Um, as before, I've created a 60 beats per minute wave with no offset and displayed it on the image below. This time, though, I've labeled the x-axis using milliseconds. As this wave is at 60 beats per minute, this means that we have one second or a thousand milliseconds per wave. So to specify an offset using the time base, we have to specify it in milliseconds. Here we see a wave offset by 250 milliseconds or a quarter of a wavelength. And here is one in antiphase offset by 500 milliseconds. Remember though, the time base numbers will change depending on the BPM that you've chosen. So to calculate the period of one wave in milliseconds, you simply do 60 divided by the BPM multiplied by 1000. If you use both the phase offset and the time base together, then these two offsets will be added. 
Um, only do this if you have a good reason to do so, otherwise it can get pretty confusing. So let's use our newfound knowledge to make our pattern more interesting. This time I've created three waves uh, with a phase offset of 0, 85 and 170. 85 is one third of 255, um, so that means that these waves are going to be offset by a third of a wavelength uh, from each other. Before we look at the pattern on the strip here, let's have a look at the uh, serial output. Uh, if nothing else, it looks quite nice. Uh, you can see them offset uh, a third of a wave away from each other. I've assigned red, white and blue to each one of these waves. So let's have a look at what that looks like on our strip. You can see the lights are sort of chasing each other, a third of a wavelength behind each other. Uh, and hopefully you could see how you could add to this pattern or uh, improve it fairly easily. So far, we've been using our wave function to, to decide which LED to light up. Uh, but let's assign the sine wave to strip brightness instead. Here I'm using the green and blue palette example from the last video uh, with just one small change. So what I've done here is created a sine wave at 30 beats per minute and uh, values are going from 50 to 255. Um, I haven't gone from zero here because I want this to affect the brightness of the strip uh, and I don't want it to go compl switch completely off. Then when I select the color from the palette down here, um, in the brightness uh, argument down here, I'm using that sine wave. And so what that should do is it should fade the strip up and down. It basically pulses it brighter and dimmer um, every two seconds because it's 30 beats per minute. Uh, and I think that gives quite a nice effect. Only using one wave uh, can make our patterns a bit predictable. So we can add waves together to produce more interesting effects. What I've got here is a, a sine wave and a second sine wave with twice the frequency of the first. If we add those two together, we get a much more interesting effect. One thing you'll notice though, is that the resultant wave um, is got double the amplitude, it's got double the height of the previous one. So what we need to do here is we need to divide this by two uh, to bring everything back down to be in the right range again. And so let's use this pattern on our strip instead. Um, if you add three waves, by the way, just divide the output by three. In this example, I've created two waves uh, that have the same phase, uh, but one of these is at twice the frequency of the other. So we have 30 beats per minute and 60 beats per minute. And I'm going to use these uh, to set the position of the LED that I'm lighting up. I've also created another sine wave down here uh, to use as the, the color of the LED. And then you can see in our sort of LEDs function down here, the position is beat one plus beat two. And remember, we've divided it by two here at the end to bring everything back down into range again. And I'm going to set that to a color. And the hue of that color, because it's an HSV color, depends on the third wave that I've created here. As before, I'm using fade to black by uh, to dim all of the LEDs and to leave a nice trail behind the main dot. You can see that the movement is a lot less predictable uh, and more interesting. And it nicely follows the shape of the graph that we plotted uh, a moment ago. We could even add a second dot and another couple of waves to make a symmetrical pattern, something like this. So I've now got uh, position B3 and position B4. Our first LED is just using the first two sine waves added together, and our second LED is using the third and fourth sine waves added together. And you can see this makes a pleasing sort of symmetrical effect. So the possibilities with waves like this are uh, pretty much endless. For another quick example, here I'm using the fill palette function. Um, I'm using two sine waves mixed together. So I've defined a palette, a gradient palette up here, um, and then I've got beat A and beat B, and they have slightly different BPMs. We've got 30 BPM and 20 BPM. And again, I'm adding them together and dividing by two here to choose which color to use out of the palette. This uh, would be a lot more boring if we we're just using one wave, because again, it would look a lot more predictable. This next example is almost the same, but I'm showing it to you as sometimes, but not always, <laughs> this exposes a, a bug in FastLED. Uh, here, I'm using the fill rainbow function uh, instead of fill palette. And with certain combinations of values, you can get an errant sort of red pixel appearing on the strip. Uh, you might be able to make it out in the uh, video below there. Now, the FastLED developers are aware of this issue, but thankfully, there's a quick and easy fix for this. Just go to your libraries folder, which on Windows is normally in documents, um, Arduino libraries, and then go to the FastLED folder here. And uh, you want to open colorutils.cpp, this folder just here. And what you want to do is look for the two functions, fill rainbow, fill rainbow. Uh, one of them is a CHSV, one of them is CRGB. And on the line here where it says hsv.sat, it's line 43. You want to change that 240 to be 255 and do the same thing underneath here where it's line 57. You want to change that to be 255 as well. If we save that, then when we go to re-upload our code again, this time we shouldn't get that flashing red um, light. One last wave function to have a look at here is beat eight instead of beat sine eight, uh, which works similarly to beat sine eight, but it produces a sawtooth wave uh, instead of a, a sine wave. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, if we write it to the console. 
and we see that it jumps up and then it comes straight back down again. So you can see it looks like a saw blade, hence it being a sawtooth wave. And um, unlike beat sine 8, beat 8 doesn't have a low val or a high val uh, parameter. So I'm taking care of that myself here by using this map function. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm mapping the 0 to 255 coming out of beat 8 to 0 to numleds minus 1, because I'm going to use this as a, as a position. So using the built-in Arduino map function to do that. So here we have a 40 BPM sawtooth wave with no time base offset, uh, which returns 0 to 255 being mapped to the number of LEDs that I've got. Um, I don't think this function is quite as useful as uh, beat sine 8, but there's definitely a place for this in certain patterns. We'll now move on to the blur functions. And for now, we'll just focus on blur 1D, uh, which is what you need on a strip rather than a matrix. If you're using a matrix, you want to use the blur 2D function, and we might get to that eventually. Uh, what blur does is it spreads the light from each pixel to its two immediate neighbors. Uh, if you want the light to spread to more than two neighbors, then you need to call blur 1D multiple times to do that. Every time you call blur, light, the light actually gets a little bit dimmer. So eventually all of the LEDs will have faded to black. Uh, the blur amount parameter is mentioned in the source code. And here it says that 172 uh, is about the maximum amount of blur spreading you can get without it starting to flicker. But just have a little play about with these values. The values are from 0 to 255, but usable is about 0 to, to 172. If we call blur multiple times on this single red pixel, uh, you can see that the light spreads out or blurs into the background. Uh, of course, we can also blur together different colors uh, for more interesting effects. In our first blur example here, we start by calling reset strip. All that does is uh, fill the strip with red, green, and blue stripes. So it's a third filled with each one. Um, every two seconds, I then switch between uh, showing them as separate color blocks and blurring them together. You can see here that I've actually called blur 1D four times. Uh, that's to spread the light out a little bit more. You can also see that when I blur this, um, the light overall light becomes a little bit dimmer, and that's kind of what we expect. In our final blur example, I'm going to reuse most of the code from our sine wave demo from earlier, uh, where we had our three sine waves uh, spaced a third of a wave apart. Uh, it's exactly the same here, except I've changed the colors here to red, green, and blue to make it more obvious what's going on. Uh, first of all, this is what it looks like uh, with blurring switched off, our red, green, and blue lights moving back and forth uh, along the strip. If I switch blurring on here, again, I've used blurring four times with a blurring amount of 50. And here you can see we get a smoother or sort of softer effect uh, as the colors blend into uh, to one another. Uh, in fact, we could also turn off uh, fade to black by here if we wanted to, to give a different effect again. So let's have a look what that looks like. Uh, and that gives a pattern that's even more illuminated uh, than the previous one. So the best thing to do with this stuff is to have a play about with these variables, have a play about with these functions uh, and see what result looks best uh, for the pattern that you're aiming for. Okay, thanks for watching everyone. I hope you now have a little bit more understanding of the wave and blur functions on FastLED. Uh, all the code we've looked at today is available at the GitHub link in the description. As usual with these videos, we've only just scratched the surface really uh, of what's available in the FastLED library. And there are many more functions and methods that you can have a play about with. So take what you've learned here, expand on it and see what you can create. Okay, bye for now and see you in the next episode.